Good evening once again. It's good to uh, have you again with us. If you're joining us online, we're just going to go before the, word, the Lord in prayer before we go into the word. Lord Jesus, we come now again just thanking you for just this opportunity, Lord. Another, another day you've brought us through, another week you're bringing us through. Through trials and tests, Lord, you remain faithful. And we thank you. And we pray, God, now that as we humble and quiet our hearts before you, that you would just speak to us. Lord, even as we lift up our song before you, God, these songs of worship and praise, may they be a sweet sound in your ear. And Lord, inhabit our praises wherever we are, Lord, and uh, just draw us near into your presence. Cleanse us, purify us, Lord, prepare us, make us a sanctuary for you, for your Holy Spirit to dwell in. We love and we thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
with trumpet sound Oh may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone For less to stand before the throne Christ the Savior's love and through the storm He is Lord Lord of all Well good evening CCR thanks for being here tonight and joining us it was uh, amazing worship love being able to to be here in the middle of the week, um, I, I've always said uh, it's, a, it's a rest in the middle of uh, what we all have is a week where we get things put on our shoulders and there's stresses and worries. And tonight is going to be an opportunity to let all of that fall away. So welcome. Uh, you know, if, uh, if you're visiting, welcome to Calvary Chapel, Richmond. Um, I know we have a lot of visitors now that we're online and and. So for those that are part of the CCR body or those that are visiting, glad you could join us tonight. I want to introduce myself. My name is Scott. Uh, for the visitors and for those of you who know me, my name is Scott. It's been a minute and I haven't seen a lot of you. And uh, frankly, had I not gotten a haircut uh, recently, I had a really good mohawk and I looked like I had just walked out of the movie Point Break. So you may not have even recognized me. But had to introduce myself uh, tonight, we're going to be continuing uh, the study of the book of Colossians, and we'll be uh, in chapter 1 again this evening. And honestly, uh, when I come here and I get a chance to come up and, and teach the Word of God, I'm, I'm used to people actually being here, so the fact that people aren't here is, is a little off. I'm used to walking around and, uh, and really looking to my left and to my right, so the first thing I had to do when I, get, when I got here was find out where my left and right limits were. Uh, I didn't realize that I could be off camera to my right and to my left. And, and then I had to realize I can only really stare at you because you're the ones looking back at me instead of uh, people in the sanctuary. I'm so used to looking to my left or right. If you see me looking to my left or right tonight during the teaching, there's no one here. I'm literally looking at empty seats, and it's just a habit I can't break. So bear with me. Uh, I will try and, and literally just look in the camera. So we're going to be reading 10 verses tonight. Colossians chapter 1, and it's going to be verses 19 through 29. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and uh, break it out. Or if you don't, Blue Letter Bible on your phone is a great resource to use as well. Colossians 1, verses 19 through 29. And, and really what we're going to do is walk through two themes that the Holy Spirit is presenting us uh, in this portion of Scripture. Um, you know, the Word of God is extremely rich. Uh, when you read it, there's a summoning uh, of God to us to draw closer, to draw nearer to Him. Um, there's such love. Uh, there's such peace in his word, uh, and it's beautiful to read. And the one thing I, I, I don't want to do this evening is to forego that. Um, God speaks to us through his word, and I don't want to forego that. And uh, tonight, uh, read it like it's a book where we just go through a, a quick set of verses, and, and that's it. Like we're reading um, and going from a chapter to a chapter, and then we forget what we've actually read. Um, you know, we do that with chapter books where we actually will, you know, you get to a point, well, I'm going to read to the next chapter. I'm just going to hurry up because dinner's ready or, or I need to go to bed, so I'm going to hurry up and, and get to the, the, the next chapter. And I don't want to do that tonight. Uh, let that not be that way with us. Uh, and, and so we want to read God's Word and let it marinate um, in our soul. And, you know, it, it, it's like this. For those of you that, that cook, it's like marinating a steak. 
And I actually thought it was funny to even bring this up in, in, in relation, but it, it's a good correlation. When, when you, and if you're vegan and you don't eat meat, I would like for you to think of something you marinate, uh, because this is the only example I have. But when you marinate steak or, or something else, you actually throw all the ingredients together, and, and, and without any extra equipment, you, you let the meat sit in that, in that marinade, whether it, you let the Worcestershire sauce and, and the onion powder and garlic salt and salt and pepper and, and balsamic vinegar, you let it all um, get soaked up by the meat. Well, if, you ever, if you've ever done that for only 15 minutes, when you cook the meat and you get the meat back off the grill, you're going to rarely taste the marinade because you didn't give it enough time to soak up. So tonight what we want to do is read the Word of God and allow it to marinate ourselves because what we want is for God's Word to come out of us in our, in our thoughts, in our words, um, when we relate to people we work around, um, just in our day-to-day uh, business, we want God's word to, to come out in everything. Uh, and so that's what we want to do tonight. I, I do think it's quite funny that I used a, a, a visual picture of marinade. It's summertime, barbecue's on the brain, and I haven't had dinner tonight. So just bear with me. So let's go ahead and read. We're going to read Colossians 1, verses 19 through 29, and then we'll pray, and then we'll kind of Then we'll dig into it. So let's read. So uh, Colossians 1, verses 19 through 29. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh What is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery, which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him... We preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working which works in me mightily. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we come before you tonight and um, Father, we desire for ourselves to really be removed remove the cares and the worries, remove those things that have piled up from the day and take those off of our shoulders. That's a burden you don't want us to bear. You desire for us to sit at your feet and that's, that's what we want to do tonight, Father. We desire to have our eyes sit upon you and, and hear from your Holy Spirit. I pray that your Holy Spirit speaks through me tonight. Father, you have something different for each person tonight that's, that's listening watching, reading these verses, you have something different for each of us. So I pray our hearts are open. Let our hearts be fertile soil. God, we desire for you to do a work in us tonight. And we pray that we would see yourself revealed in this scripture tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. I, I love being able to, to read the word and, and, and take time. And that's, uh, that's kind of what we're going to do tonight. So the title tonight is Christ Our Rescue Transfigured to Proclaim. And, and really it speaks to having, some, ha- having been something and, and having been drawn out of something, changed and been given a new direction um, and, and really a new mission. That's really what that means and that's really what this portion of scripture is speaking to us about. Um, 
it, it, it speaks to us of where we've come from, how we need to be reminded about that, what God wants us to do, and really, it's as simple as that. What we were like, where we were, where we came from, what Jesus did for us, and what our responsibility is. <laughs> oh yeah, you've actually got homework after reading the scripture tonight um, to actually put into practice after we read tonight. It's all right though, it's easy homework, you're going to like it, so don't, uh, don't run away. So like the picture you see or that you've been shown in the title slide, it's a picture of a bridge. Um, and, and it gives you the illusion of you've actually come from somewhere. There, there's, there's a place behind you that, that is behind you. You're no longer there. But you also have in front of you a place to go to. There's, a, there's an end point in front of you. And you're not designed to just stay where you are. Because as you can see or saw in the picture, you're, you're on a bridge you have to go to the other side. And, and like this picture, this, f- this first of two themes, if you will, is simply saved from. Um, I like to keep it simple, and I'm not good at, at marrying up words or making things start with the same letter. So uh, saved from is the first thing we're going to look at. Yeah. You know, One reminder that Pastor Tim mentioned when uh, he opened up this series is Paul wrote this from prison, and he desired to strengthen the church, and and not just the Colossian church, but the entire body of Christ. And he leads off this portion talking about peace and having made peace through the blood of his cross, as verse 20 says. Now, I'll be honest, I don't really know a lot of things that make peace. I I, I know too much of things that do the exact opposite, things that create anger, things that create distrust, things that create war, things that can break. But peace, I don't know anything uh, that the world can offer that can create peace. Now, I know a lot of things that are touted, and advertise to do that. Shoot, this world is extremely good at illusion and, and, and providing illusions of what can be presented and what can be done. The world loves to give them. Uh, if it wants, you want to get bigger, you want to get smaller. You know, uh, you want to forget all your stresses. Look, there's no sugar in this. You can eat and drink as much of it as you want. So we see this all too often. But peace. Not so much. The first results that I got, and I like to do this occasionally, is just throw it into Google and see what the world brings back. So the first time I put this into Google as a search, what brings peace? Uh, I know the answer, but I want to see what Google pulls back. I got got four different results. The first result was 15 things that could bring you peace. The second was 40 things. The third only had nine. Nine. And the fourth had 20 that could give me peace. And they ranged from making lists to looking out of a window. We're talking about lists and looking out of a window. That's not what I call peace. And and, and just this example, clearly there's no standard in the world for peace that can create true peace. But we have a standard that can create and gives peace. And his name is Jesus Christ. Paul starts this portion of scripture off boldly and plainly, stating that Christ has become our rescue and is making peace and has made peace through the cross and the sacrifice that he gave on the cross. It was real. Jesus' death on the cross was real. People needed to be reminded that the death and resurrection of Jesus was real. It was a very real death that took place on a very real Roman cross with a very real resurrection. It reminds us of the very real victory that we are given over death. Where we can't create anything that gives us true peace, we see here how peace is made. And this isn't a peace 
from a hard day at work or, or a crazy quarantine day with the kids at home. That's a temporary peace, right? That's a temporary peace here and now, maybe for a Thursday afternoon or Friday. What Paul's talking about here is the peace with God that we needed and that everyone needs. They're two separate things. One is eternal and one is temporary. We don't make our own peace with God. Jesus made that for us through his work on the cross. The blood of the cross speaks to us of the very real and physical death of Jesus Christ in our place on our behalf before God. That that literal death and the literal judgment that was placed on him that he bore on our behalf is what saves us. Paul's reminding not just the church here in Colossae, but, but the church and the body of Christ that Jesus became a living sacrifice for us, took our place, and bought peace for us on the cross. Now, why? Why is this one of the the first things that he's talking about here? Well, Paul was very astute and kept tabs and knew what was going on in the places where they had planted churches. And here in the church of Coloss, here in Coloss, the church for the Colossians, um, had a problem, and they were battling different heresies. Um, similar things that we might even see in the church today. But this particular church was battling different heresies. It had a growing Gnosticism, which is Jewish mysticism, that was combined with Jewish legalism. They had started to allow the teaching... Uh, of the fact that you could earn your status with God. You could earn your peace and your standing with God. And you can't. There is no Christian check the box of things you must do and that you only have to do to earn that standing with God. There's only one thing you have to do. But that's not what they were preaching here. And to emphasize this measure, Paul actually does something that we need to have done quite often. And it's to remind us of our past and where we came from. You know, because regardless of age, regardless of testimony, no matter who's watching, how old you are, where you come from, what you look like, at one point in time, if you're a believer, we were all alienated from God. All of us. Now, For some that are watching, that might not be your case. For some that are watching, you may not have asked Jesus to be your Savior. And if you have not been washed by his blood and call him his Savior, you would fall into this category that Paul's talking about, a group alienated from God. But we're going to get back to that, so, so hang tight. But for those of us that are saved, Paul's reminding us of where we came from. You know, I like to be reminded of things. Uh, It's very helpful. I forget birthdays, anniversaries. I forget what to put in the fridge, what not to put in the fridge. I forget that you can't mix light and dark laundry. I forget what goes in the pantry, what goes somewhere else. Uh, For I turned 44 this month, and... For 44 years, I've had to rely on my sister, who's four years older than me, to remind me of my parents' birthdays and their wedding anniversary. Now, praise the Lord, my wife now keeps track of that on a calendar, but I still can't remember it. I have to be reminded. And in fact, I'm really glad that Pastor Tim, when he taught, actually reminded us that he taught on this book two years ago in 2018 because I had forgotten. It really kind of speaks to my lack of note-taking, and I really need to get better about that because I had forgotten, and it was good to remember because I was actually teaching on the same book tonight. But it's good to be reminded. The reason being is because us as a people, we forget. We forget over and over. That's why scripture, and we have to read it daily, sometimes multiple times a day, because we forget. We have to be reminded of God's promises over and over. That's why there's so many repetitive um, different topics within Psalms and Proverbs, um, and actually throughout the entire Bible, because we forget and we have to be reminded 
And, and Paul wants to do that here. We get so caught up in where we are currently. Um, we all have lives in the here and the now. And we sometimes forget where we came from. We sometimes forget where God pulled us out of the past. We forget that it wasn't us chasing after God. It was God chasing after us. He sought us first, yet while we were still sinners. And because of that, because we forget where we came from, sometimes you forget all of the grace that was given to you. You know that saying, you can't know how bad the bad news is. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I take that back. You can't know how good the good news is until you really know how bad the bad news is. That's that saying. Obviously, I say it a lot because I messed it up. But it's absolutely true. If you forget how badly you were chained in sin, you will forget and start to forget how wonderful the feeling of grace is and was when it washed over you, that when your chains were broken and when you were freed, that starts to wane when you forget. And, and, and Paul is bringing that up in this portion of Scripture because we need to keep that and have the grace of God fresh in our minds. It keeps us humble. Let me remind you that the term alienated here uh, is, is the Greek word was alatrios. And I don't speak Greek, so I'm doing the best I can with that. But it, it implies a person that has departed or is experiencing isolation. And, and, and really, that's the term, isolation from God. That's what Paul is talking about here. Uh, being alienated from God, you are isolated. And that's where we were. But that's not all Paul's talking about here. Enemies in your mind by wicked works. Enemies in your mind by wicked works. Wicked works was the rotten fruit and is the rotten fruit of being an enemy of God. Believers have the Holy Spirit and we have the fruit of the Spirit. And that's why you can see love, joy, peace, patience. And there's a list of things that the Holy Spirit produces in us. Because before Jesus, I had none of them. You know, you talk to some people who knew me before being saved and fully surrendered, and you look at that picture of me and the picture of uh, fruit of the Spirit, and it's like black and white. It's like polar opposites. But here, those that are isolated from God are enemies in your mind by wicked works. James 4.4. 4. And I was reminded when I repeat and when I read scripture to go about it slowly because I know there are some people that like to turn and find it. And I'll, I'll do my best. James 4.4 4 says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And I mean, this is me. Like I was a total enemy of God. I was a total friend of the world. Um, and, and I didn't realize that by being a friend of the world made me an enemy of the creator of the universe. But that is not how God wants us to be. He does not want us to stay in that, uh, in that position. And if you're listening tonight, he does not want you to stay in that. And he has a plan and a rescue for you. And it's beautiful. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 5. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 5 says, But God, who is rich in mercy... And I could stop right there. That is so powerful. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. Paul is bringing up the past, not to revel in it or, or to remember it or, or to say, hey, you should go back there. But he's bringing that up to remind us of our future and remind us that we are going somewhere. Paul reminds us that it is through Jesus we are no longer alienated. Romans 6, verse 6 says, Knowing this, 
that our old man was crucified with him, and the body of sin, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Did you know you have a choice? You don't have to be slaves to sin. For all of us that have asked Jesus into our heart to be our Savior, we chose to get out of chains. We chose to not be bound by them. And for those of you watching online, you have a choice. You can have those chains broken tonight. I mean, when you stop and you reflect on these things, God's word is awesome. To know and be confident that the work was finished on the cross with Jesus, I have nothing to do, and I've been saved by his grace. Everything's been finished, and I can be presented holy and blameless, as we see in Scripture here. It's something that I have the hardest time thinking about. I, I, I can't wrap my mind around the, it's amazing. It's all I can, all I can say. The idea of presenting us holy and blameless before God recalls the terminology used when priests would actually inspect the potential sacrifices. We are presented holy and blameless to God as a living sacrifice. We are a new creation. You know, Romans 12.1 states, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves, you present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You know, it's a reasonable service for us to present ourselves, all of us, our time, our talent, our treasure. It's reasonable because of what Jesus did for us. I mean, do we really need another reason? Okay, how about Romans 5.10? Romans 5.10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God did this. I mean, he sent his Son while we were still, while we were yet sinners, to save us. How's that? Um, you know, I'm thankful when somebody buys me a, a lunch, like I owe them, you know, I want to I pay it back. I want to show them my, 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 my thankfulness. That's a lunch. I mean, that's gone within 15 minutes, depending on where you eat. Jesus bought eternity for me. I should give everything to him. And, and we're almost done with this first theme of being saved, saved from. But there's a sub-bullet, there, there's a secondary um, item here that we have to cover. It goes along with this. It speaks to the fact that we have a responsibility. Verse 23 says, if indeed you continue. This speaks of a responsibility of ours. Salvation is a free gift. It is undeniable. It's given to us graciously by our Heavenly Father because of what Jesus did for us. But we have a responsibility to continue in the faith, and, and, and to not be swayed or moved. You know, we, and, and the reason why I said earlier, it, it's good to slow down when we read Scripture, because I could read these 10 verses that we're going over tonight and miss the depth of this portion right here if we continue. We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to stand firm, firm on the rock of, of, of the Word of God, to not be swayed and not be moved. Hebrews 12, verse 2, says, Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This speaking of Jesus. He gave us an example, and where we need to run the race with our eyes looking forward to what awaits us and what is promised to us. Jesus didn't keep his eyes on the here and now and the cross that he was about to be nailed to. He kept his eyes on the joy that was set before him. He didn't let the fact that people were telling on him and they were trying to set him up and that he knew he was going to the cross, he didn't let that sway him from the truth that he knew and what the will of the Father was. We don't either. Paul's reminding us, you know, we're a new creation and we're not to go back to the former things. This is, you know, 
this is all, in, it, it, it falls all up underneath it if indeed you continue. We gotta stay firm and we gotta stay the course here. We're not to go back to the former things. If, if Jesus has pulled you out of sin and broken those chains, why in the world are you gonna go back and, and, and fasten that shackle back on your wrists and on your ankles? Why are you gonna go back to that? Isaiah 43, 18 tells us to not remember the former things. And that's different than what I just talked about, how Paul's making us remember where we came from. Isaiah here, not to remember the former things. That's not to remember and like want to go back, not go back and start doing the old things. Titus 3, 9 talks about this too in a different light. Titus 3, 9 says, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. I have seen too many people and have seen too much destruction in the church because of what Satan uses to cause discord and to cause divisiveness. When Paul says to continue He's talking about not letting things get in the way of what you know is true. Titus 3.9 3, talks about avoid foolish disputes. We see too many fractions in churches, too, many, too much divisiveness in the body of Christ because of things that Titus says are unprofitable and useless. Why are we doing that as a church body? Why are we doing it as a body of Christ? We have to stop that. We have to continue in the faith, we have to continue as Paul says. We have to go back to the first thing, like the, the, the letters in Revelations. We have to remember and return to our first love. Spurgeon says specifically of verses 20 through 23 of this text, this is a text that ought to be read and pondered every day by the many unstable professors who are in the church at this present time. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, like a building that will have no further settlements, no more starting of the stones, no more cracking of the walls, because your foundation is sure, your, your foundation is secure, and you are firmly built upon it. That's Spurgeon, right? So, He's saying the same thing that is applicable even now. And that's the first theme that, that the Holy Spirit has for us, saved from. Well, here's the thing. When, when, when you are, are changing directions and you are not where you were and you are now somewhere new, you have a new mission, you have a new direction. So you are saved too. You are saved to do something. I, am not, I was not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ to sit on a couch and watch TV. That's, that, that's not the mission God has for any of us, right? It, he saves us to do something. He saves us and brings us to a place where we are now no longer who we were, and after redeeming us, we have a new direction and a new mission. We're reminded in this portion of Scripture uh, of Paul's rejoicing, his example of rejoicing in his current status. Remember, remember, Paul wrote this from a prison cell. And we're not talking about uh, a current prison cell where you get three meals a day, internet, TV, and, you know, you get a view. He was in a, a, a Roman prison, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't nice. But he realized that his life being poured out was to strengthen and to build up the body of Christ. He could see that what he was enduring was good for the Colossian church and what would be the body of Christ throughout the world. I have to put this up because this is going to be a gut check. And it is by Richard Wormbrandt. A faith that can be destroyed by suffering is not faith. Very short quote, but it will put you in check. And Richard Wormbrandt had the right to say it. We are to rejoice in trials and tribulations, not for our sake, 
but for the body of Christ and what, what God is going to do through us while, we're, while we are in that season. It speaks of those ministerial sufferings which Paul bears because he represents Jesus Christ. Paul suffered these things not for himself. He didn't, vo- he didn't raise his hand like, you know what, I would love to go to a Roman prison. He didn't volunteer to do that. But he knew that by doing that for the body of Christ, they would be built up and the Lord would be glorified. Paul call, calls this a stewardship from God, right? a stewardship. It's, it's a responsibility that God had given him and is reminding us that it, it's a responsibility and stewardship that, that we are given. You know, you, you remember growing up, you, you started off chores or, uh, and, and I'm not even going to bring up allowance because some of us never got allowance. Uh, I did later on. But, you know, at first you start, your parents, uh, your mom or your dad or both or a guardian started just small. You know, empty the trash. No big deal. But then, then you graduated to mowing lawns. And you were responsible for like filling the lawnmower with gas. You had to empty the lawn trimmings. You, you had to, you know, spray and hose it off and keep it clean. And, and okay, that was a little bit more responsibility. And then you grew up and um, all of a sudden now you are given the, a bigger responsibility for those that were able to have or borrow a car, that's a much larger responsibility and, and you were expected to do more things with it. You now had to pay attention to maintenance. You had to fill it with gas, check the oil, check the tires, clean it out, clean the outside, clean the inside. Some of us do that, some of us don't. No names need to be said, but those are just examples. And, and these were responsibilities our, our folks or, or you know, guardians as we grew up gave us. And that was a responsibility or stewardship from our, uh, of our home and house items from our earthly mother or father or parents or guardian. But what's spoken about here is a stewardship of greater responsibility from our heavenly father. We are rescued from sin for eternity, and that's a stewardship that we have. And it's, it's such a contrast in comparison to today. It's a very me, self-focused, self-centered culture now. To read this and to understand what it means is a breath of fresh air. It's a picture that, to wake many up, did, did you know you can actually live your life for someone other than you? I mean, alert, you can actually live your life without being focused on yourself and actually be others-minded. Now, this is something that all of us can be reminded of. Remember, I talked about being reminded because we can forget. and We we get so caught up with with things going on in our lives, we can forget. I can forget to live for someone else when I'm so, you know, head down in my own uh, life and, and events going on. But it's so rare now that when someone is selfless, they are instantly a YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter star. Uh, I mean, we're talking like basic selfless acts all of a sudden are touted as amazing and hero-like. Like, they're not. That's what it should be. But we are to be counterculture. We are not to look like the world nor adopt the world's practices. While they may be, and the world around us, whether at work or at home or neighborhood, while they may be self-focused, we are not afforded that ability. We have been saved for a reason, and it is not to just sit around and be self-focused all the time. It's okay to have times where you do take time to, to focus on yourself and take care of yourself. That's not what I'm saying. But all the time, that's not the case. We need to be counterculture. Don't live just for ourselves. Pour your life out that God may be glorified and, and others saved. But also, it's not just that others may come to know Christ, but that the church itself may be built up and strengthened. Did you know that sometimes the Lord allows you to go through things, not necessarily for the unbeliever to see, but to strengthen someone else in the body who might be going through the same thing silently? Did you know that? It's both. They're a parallel track, and God's going to use you for both of them. 
But we have to understand it, it can be used for both. It's outside the body, but also inside. And Paul knew that him being in prison for Jesus and standing up for Christ was not just to have more new believers, but it was also to strengthen those that were part of the body. Now, what about this mystery? <clears throat> Did you know that there were things talked about in the Old Testament that uh, weren't revealed into the New Testament? Newsflash, uh, it, it took place. Hosea 2.23, I, I love this example. Hosea 2.23 says, Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained a mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, You are my people, and they shall say, You are my God. In the biblical sense, a mystery is not like a riddle or, or you know, whodunit or, or clue where you're trying to find things out. It's, that's not the word that, that we perceive it to be or mean. It, what it means is it's a truth that can only be revealed by revelation, not by our own worldly or humanly intuition. It can be known because it has been revealed to his saints. Paul here refers to the many aspects of the works of Jesus in his people, but especially the plan of the church to make one body out of the Jew and the Gentile. I want to read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. So Ephesians 3, verses 3 through 6 says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. I praise the Lord for this mystery that allowed me to be grafted in and called a son of God. First Peter, verse, uh, First Peter chapter 1, verse 12 says, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. I love that beautiful picture. This mystery that even the angels desire to look into and that they marveled at. Joel 2 verse 32 says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be delivered was for the Gentiles as well as now. I love Galatians 3.28 too because it outlines, it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. I love Spurgeon, so I have one more for you. And it says, We rejoice in Christ and nothing else but Christ. Christ and no priestcraft. Christ and no philosophy. Christ and no modern thought. Christ and no human perfection. Christ, the whole of Christ and nothing else but Christ. Here lies the mystery of the gospel of the grace of of God. And this brings us to our last point tonight and a charge that Paul has for each of us. We preach nothing but Jesus. No works, no stature, no position, just Jesus. We are to teach of the need of repentance and the warning of eternity to come as well. But we preach Jesus. Paul says in the scripture here, warning every man, and of course, when, when, when you read man, it's man and woman, right? So warning every man and woman. And I want to say every has the connotation of every. Like it's every, right? So it's a statement that is blind to whomever. There's no classifications here. There's no delineation. It's just every. The term warning also really means, not, not like a um, flashing warning, but 
but it can depending on the, the, the situation. But really, it means to impart wisdom and understanding. I love examples. So in this regard, warning every man and woman, let me, let me, let me Barney style break it down for you here. Uh, March of 2003, I was deployed to Operation Iraqi Freedom. I uh, went over in January of 2003. And uh, at this point in time, uh, all the U.S. forces, almost all, had already moved over. Camp Commando, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Camp Doha, we were all there. And I was walking to the Chow Hall, or for those of you that aren't familiar, that's the dining facility, to uh, eat. Uh, I was halfway there when the base sirens went off. Um, and at this point, in the buildup before we crossed over the berm into Iraq, uh, that could only mean one thing, that Scud missiles had actually launched and they were inbound. And they didn't launch just one because Scud missiles weren't extremely accurate. So they had to launch multiple in order to try and hit one target. And everyone was in our area. So being air defense and knowing what would come next, uh, having a Patriot battery out behind Camp Doha, Patriot missile launchers go off and everyone basically shudders from how loud they are. And they don't have a 100% kill rate. So on Camp Doha, there were concrete bunkers and sandbags everywhere. And, and you don't wait to find out what's happening next. When you hear the base sirens go off, you already know what's taking place. You dive in the bunker and start to pray and wait for next. But some don't have that immediate reaction. Some have a slower time frame while they try and understand what's taking place. As I was like jumping into the bunker, I grabbed the blouse of this soldier. The blouse is just the, the, the top of the uniform of this guy. I have no idea who he was. Didn't know the unit. Didn't know how long he'd been there. Didn't know his name. Didn't know his rank. Didn't know his hair color. Didn't know his eye color. Didn't know his skin color. And I didn't care. I wanted him to go where I was going because I wanted him to live. You, don't, you, you just don't think. You, it, there's no time for analysis on that. That's an example here of what the scripture is, is telling us to do. It doesn't matter who the unsaved are. It doesn't matter what they look like. What we are saved to do is to reach out to anyone else. Plain and simple. I use that example because I, I wanted to be saved myself, but I wanted to bring him with me. Why am I going to jump in the bunker and leave somebody out there who isn't, he, he's not understanding what is taking place, and I do. For those of us that are saved, we know that there's an eternity, and there's only two places you can spend it, hell or in heaven. And for those of us that are saved, we're going there. Praise the Lord. We're going to heaven, and we're going to spend eternity with Jesus. We have got to have a heart for those that we know are not. And that's what this scripture is really talking about. Um, it's warning every man and teaching every man and woman in all wisdom. We are to teach them of Jesus, that he is the way, the truth, the life, that those would hear would also be presented as perfect in Christ just as we're presented perfect. If I know that I'm being presented perfect in Christ and I look to my brother or sister and I know that they're not, why don't I want them to be with me? You know, that's, it breaks my heart when I know that I have failed in that area and, and I am telling you this tonight at the same time, I had to write these notes and I had to deal with the Holy Spirit on a lot of this myself. Ro Roman, but you, you ask, okay, well, well, you know, let me hear some scripture about that. Okay. Romans 10, 14, I love this. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? In, in John 5, one of the last examples, in John 5, a man paralyzed um, at the pool of Bethesda um, and, and couldn't make it down to the pool, Jesus walks up to him and actually says, rise, take up your bed and walk, and he did. Instantly healed by the faith he had because he, he was like, yes, all I want to do is get better. And you know what he did? He didn't know it was Jesus. There were Jews that came up and asked him, and he actually said, I, I have no clue, I don't know. And it was a truthful statement. 
But when he saw Jesus teaching in the temple and he realized it was Jesus that healed him, he went back and he told people what Jesus did. Like, you know, Pastor Tim um, two Sundays ago talked about his testimony. Our testimony, we t- have we told people what Jesus has done in our lives? They can't argue with that. They, they have, if I bring up my history and, and, and who I was before Christ, no one can argue with that. Many can agree with it, but th- there's visible truth. Our testimony is visible to people and it's a powerful weapon and we have to, we have to use that. We've been healed. We've been healed from the curse of sin. We, we no longer have to pay for that with, for eternity, separated from God. It's a spiritual healing that we need to remember. You know, the world builds scales on our eyes. And I pray that the Lord would remove those scales. Refresh us with the knowledge and the remembrance of the grace that each of us were given but when we became a believer, like spark that fire in us, fan that flame. That's what I pray as we read this scripture. And, and believe me, had I, just, had I just read 10 verses and moved on and had coffee and be like, check, did my Devo, I would not have, have heard this from the Holy Spirit. I would not have allowed him to, to tell me that. And that's what Paul's saying here. It's his charge to us to preach Christ and teach every man and woman that they may be presented faultless as well. And it, that's, that's what, what I'm doing. I'm preaching this to myself. Uh, I'm not just telling you. Because I have to live this out as well. I have to do my own homework. Um, but it's beautiful. We have to continue, as the scriptures say. You know, the bond in these verses is that we are redeemed by Christ's work on the cross in order that we might know we have this hope and that we're going to be presented faultless and perfect because of Jesus' blood. And that we would be his witnesses, right? We would be his witnesses in all ways, in all things, in all places, and draw others to Jesus and also build up the saints, build up and strengthen those within the church. And you know, I, I said I'd, I'd get to it later, but for those of you that are watching and, and you, you're saying, you know, I, I fit into that first category. I'm a, a, I haven't asked Jesus as my Savior, and I, I'm isolated from God. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I, I pray that you read Romans 10.9. I just want to, you know, some, the enemy would love to confuse you on, on, on becoming saved. Romans 10.9 is simple, and I love the verse. It says, all you have to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. You, you have to ask Jesus to be your savior and repent of your sinful life and he'll come in like a flood and, and your, the Holy Spirit will be revealed to you. And I pray that if you're watching tonight and you don't know Jesus as your savior, that, that you'll just consider that. Read Joel 2, 32, that Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Read Romans 10.9. I just pray you consider that. Ask him to be your savior. Become one of the family. But for those of us that are saved and are, and are watching tonight, uh, I pray that this ministered to you. Um, I pray that, that through the scripture, you get a, a fresh remembrance of where you were when God called you out and God freed you. Um, a fresh remembrance of what God's grace feels like. And and that, man, may we have a new wave of showing people what God's grace is, but also that we would all be reminded of we have homework. We we have a job to do. He saved us for a purpose, and that's to shine for him, to live for him uh, in all things. Um, With that, let's, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for revealing yourself in your word. It's by your word we understand your will, and we know what your will is, Lord. We know that you have a plan and a purpose for each one of us, and that it's beautiful, and you desire for us to build one another up, to reach out and, and, and preach the freedom that you offer that's a free gift of salvation to those that don't know you. Um, Father, may we lock arms as brothers and sisters and do this. Whether, 
whether in our own family or in work or at the grocery store, in, on a sports team. Uh, Father, with those, if for those that are in school, for those that, that um, are on a business trip or on a street corner, God, thank you for bringing this to remembrance. Lord, I, I, we would not have had the depth of your word if it weren't for the revelation of your Holy Spirit and how he opens that scripture. Thank you. We praise you. Pray that this word would be planted in our heart and that you would bring about beautiful fruit uh, because of it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for attending. I look forward to seeing you guys Sunday or online. Have a blessed night.